Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> I'm going to ask you to think about all of the living things in the world, bio, the di di biodiversity of the planet, um, all the species, animals, plants, microorganisms. <clears throat> and I'm going to ask you to think about them going through uh, a filter. And the filter is us. It's humans, it's our activities, it's the landscapes that we dominate. And as these species go through this filter, some of them make it and some of them don't. The ones that don't make it, whoops, there we go, that's not working, go extinct. They go extinct like the guys there on the left, that's not working. Um, <clears throat> The ones that survive, the ones that do make it through the filter, are the species that we see around us today. And I have them categorized here in four different ways. The first is agriculture. That is, these are species that we use. Um, we use them for the products that they produce. Um, and the second group is exploitation. That is, species that we harvest, okay? Species like the fish that we uh, harvest from the seas. And then there's two other groups of, of uh, species that I focus on in my own research, and these are related to conservation. That is, these are species that are actually on their way to becoming extinct, and we work very hard to try and keep them uh, with us on the planet. And then there are groups of species that are adapting to us. They are doing very well. <clears throat> All of these are happening through a process of natural selection. Darwin was the first one to articulate the idea of how species adapt to their environments through a process of natural selection. So what I want to do here is first go through what are the nuts and bolts of natural selection and explain how natural selection is important or why natural selection is important in terms of conservation uh, in general. <clears throat> okay. So... Four components of natural selection. The first one is variation. That the idea that there, is, there are differences among individuals. So if you look at a species, there are some individuals among that species that are large, for example, some are small. These traits, these characteristics have an under, or these differences in, in these traits or characteristics have an underlying genetic basis. And we call that heritability. I'll talk about that in a second. There is competition and differential fitness, and all that means is that the, the resources that are available for reproductive success and survival are limited. I mean, what this means is that not all individuals will survive. I'll give you a thought experiment. Let's walk through this. This is a chipmunk. Imagine, now everything comes back to chipmunks with me because I did my PhD on them, so the stories are endless. Um, but imagine a chipmunk, a population of chipmunks on an island. And there's variation. Some are large and some are small. The small ones die. It doesn't matter how. They can die from a number of uh, natural causes, disease, predators, climate. But they die. The small ones die. The remainder, the survivors, ultimately will breed. You can imagine scenes of chipmunks making sweet love on the island. <laughs> and the babies they produce will also be larger, okay? The, the small ones are dead, the big ones are alive, right? So, heritability, all that means is that large chipmunks tend to produce large offspring, okay? Just like tall parents tend to produce tall kids, there's an underlying genetic basis for the differences that we see across individuals. Okay, so, if we were to look at the average size of the original population of chipmunks, we would expect that the average size would be around that top triangle. Whereas if the survivors of this selection event, whether again it be disease or predators or what have you, the average size would be larger. And so the offspring produced from the survivors would be larger than the offspring produced by the, the original population. This is a process of natural selection. And if this happens generation after generation, we see evolutionary change. Okay, so what happens if these, evol these forces, these selective pressures, these disease, predators, climate, what happens if they are replaced or influenced by us? Okay, by people. <clears throat> what happens 
when we influence natural selection, whether it be in the wild or whether it be in our cities or in our zoos. And in my own research, we focus on a couple of different areas, and I'm going to talk about those. The first one is what happens in, in zoos, in captive breeding programs, when we have endangered species in the wild, and we collect some from the wild, we bring them into captivity, and we breed them, and then we re-release them in the hopes that these uh, animals or plants uh, will continue to propagate in the wild and they won't go extinct. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some work that we're starting to do on cities and the idea that urban environments are dramatically different than natural environments and the kinds of traits that provide or that give success or provide a reproductive success and survival to individuals um, are quite different in these different, in these urban versus natural environments. Okay. First step, then, is to talk about captive breeding programs. These are black-footed ferrets. These are an endangered species that lives in the western prairies. They are on the verge of extinction. Uh, they are often characterized as a success story with respect to captive breeding protocols. Some individuals were brought into a number of zoos and the um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and they were bred, and now these, this colony of... of of uh, black-footed ferrets are feeding, being fed into the natural environment. And so they're being released into the western prairies. Now what's interesting is that the, the natural population, the one that's just been recently um, introduced, is, no is not yet sustainable. That is that the animals that they are releasing are not uh, surviving and reproducing to the point where the population can survive without any help. So they have to be constantly replenishing these natural populations with these animals that they are producing in, in the zoos. The point that I'm trying to make here is that the environment in which these animals are being raised and the environment in which these generations of um, ferrets are being bred in is very different from the environment in the wild. And we can think about a few different ways that that might be the case. <clears throat> so let's think about behavior. So assuming that there's a genetic basis for differences in behavior, and there's lots of evidence to suggest that, then we could talk about, you know, perhaps there are differences in behavior that could evolve in captivity. So imagine a scenario in where you have, uh, you know, let's say an animal that in the wild being aggressive, being sort of laden with testosterone, especially for males, would be good, would be beneficial in terms of reproductive success. That is that males that are aggressive and can hunt down um, well, I'll hunt down females that can <laughs> that can uh, be attractive to females or can um, can find mates are are therefore successful. But in the context of a captive population, that might be quite different. A highly aggressive individual might be very stressed out if it's kept confined. And in the end, animals that have that aggressive phenotype, that aggressive behavior, may end up having very poor reproductive success. And so the animals that end up breeding and doing well are the ones that might be more docile, the ones that don't get stressed out in captivity. Okay, and that's when you get situations like this, where someone can rub the tummy of this, you know, very fierce looking tiger. There's also examples of, you know, veterinary interventions. The animals that live in these captive breeding programs are subject to a lot of different um, situations that are very different from the wild. They're given lots of food, right? They don't have to hunt. There's no predators. Uh, they're provided with veterinary care. Um, natural selection in the context of, of the wild is not happening here. So animals that normally might not survive or reproduce in the wild are able to do so. And if they can do so, then that means that the kinds of genes that are associated with those traits are allowed to propagate in this um, captive context. So when it comes time to releasing these animals, there's a couple of different scenarios that can happen. After generations of breeding in, these captive co in a captive uh, context, you can get a very subtle um, state of domestication with these animals. And so whether that's happening with black-footed ferrets or not, we're not sure. But it is an interesting question whether the animals that are being released into the wild in these kinds of programs, are they the same as the animals that went into the breeding program? And this is all through a subtle process of natural selection that occurs in these captive breeding programs. There's the chipmunk again. 
The second set of uh, studies I want to talk about then is about, <clears throat> about cities and urban settings, urban environments, and how different they are from natural environments. We've started a study on chipmunks uh, and looking at this. The urban environment, that is, the environment that we see in cities, is fundamentally different than when compared to the natural environment. Certainly, there are different food resources, right? Here's a raccoon. On the top left corner, it's eating garbage. And on the right, it's looking for mussels in a stream bed. These are very different food resources, right? The quality of the food is very different, the types of food, and so on. Types of predators are very um, different in an urban versus um, a natural context. So in an urban environment, predators like feral cats and so on are much more predominant than what you might find in a natural environment. So my point is this, that there are big differences in a lot of biotic factors between natural and urban, urban sites. Even, even the, the thermal environment of cities is very different. The winters are not nearly as tough in cities as they are in, in natural areas. So this is a, a figure showing the fact that around Toronto, things are much, much warmer than they are in the outlying areas. <coughs> Point being here that, energetically speaking, it might not be as hard living in the city as it is living in a natural area for, for any kind of animal or, or any other species that lives in these urban environments. The distribution of these kinds of habitats that are appropriate for these animals is also quite different. So in an urban environment, there's a completely different uh, spatial uh, array of habitats, which again is going to affect the kinds of traits that are important for an animal to reproduce and survive. So my point then is that these urban environments and the natural environments in which uh, these, many of these animals, like chipmunks, for example, or other species, find themselves in are providing very different types of sources of mortality and uh, are influencing the kinds of traits that are important for these animals. And therefore, that suggests that natural selection is acting in a very different way between urban and natural environments. And I want to finish off by talking about some of the things that are relevant to the north, and that is specifically uh, resource extraction industries. We know what the ecological costs are of resource extraction. We know about pollution, we know about habitats being destroyed and so on, but we don't know very much about the evolutionary consequences of these kinds of uh, activities. So, you know, there's the oil sands, which are, of course, a, a very dramatic example, but there's also things like logging and forestry, which are altering habitats, but may also have subsequent evolutionary effects on the species that find themselves occupying these areas. And what about our own activities that have occurred here in Sudbury, right? So the historical smelting activities here have altered the landscape quite dramatically. And of course, we have the whole regreening process that's been happening now for quite some time. But you may ask, your, may ask the question, you know, is there um, an evolutionary fingerprint that's associated with these smelting activities? Have the species that exist in the Sudbury Basin, have they adapted and evolved to this changing environment that the smelting activities produced? And so these are questions that we are, are pursuing in my lab. So I'm going to finish um, by giving you the sort of a take-home message, and that is that it's important not just to think about these ecological consequences of, of these kinds of perturbations, these kinds of, you know, sort of... Um, resource extraction, uh, industries, and so on, but we need to th also think about the evolutionary consequences of the kinds of things that we're doing uh, to the environment. Thank you. Thank you.